Picture 50 feet of baby blue Christmas ribbon one inch wide. String it in a circle on edge on the floor and put a candle in the middle. Now expand the scale. The ring world was a ribbon of unreasonably strong material, a million miles wide and 600 million miles long. Strung in a circle, 95 million miles in radius, with a sun at the center. The ring spun at 770 miles per second, fast enough to produce one gravity of centrifugal force outward. The unknown ring world engineers had layered the inner surface with soil and oceans and an atmosphere. They had raised walls a thousand miles high at each rim to hold the air inside. Presumably, air leaked over the rim walls anyway, but not quickly. An inner ring of twenty rectangular shadow squares occupying what would have been the orbit of Mercury in Sol System gave a thirty-hour day and night cycle to the ring world. The ring world was 600 million million square miles of habitable planet, three million times the area of Earth. Lewis and Speaker to Animals and Nessus and Tila Brown had traveled across the ring world for almost a year, 200,000 miles across the width, then back to the point where Lyre had crashed, a fifth of the width. It hardly made them experts. Could any thinking being ever have claimed to be an expert on the ring world? But they had examined one of the spaceport ledges on the outside of the rim wall. If the hindmost spoke the truth, they would need no more. Land on the spaceport ledge, pick up whatever the hindmost expected to find, and go. Fast. Because because within the regular telescope image that the hindmost had set before them, it was painfully obvious. The baby blue arc of Ringworld, the color of three million Earth-like worlds, too far away for detail to show, but banded with midnight blue from the shadow squares, was well off-center from its sun. Hey, welcome to Sci-Fi Secrets. Larry Niven never intended on writing a sequel to The Ring World. It was originally planned to be a standalone novel, but as the years passed, the mountain of mail Niven got regarding the problems with his Ring World and his storyline kept piling up. Niven says in a preface that he wrote this book because of all the quote-unquote unsolicited help correcting things from his first novel. <laughs> I think that's a nice way of telling us he's sick of our nitpicking. <laughs> Ringworld Engineer starts off with Louis Wu on the Planet Canyon with a wire in his head. He has become addicted to current. You see, when a wire is implanted in the correct way into your brain, it can stimulate the pleasure centers. Depending on the amount of current, it can make you slightly happy, or it could turn you into a grinning vegetable. Or anything in between. Most people start off light and become more and more addicted to the feeling. Many stop caring about the rest of the world and starve to death, with food in the fridge only feet away. Some gangs would even use this as a way to kill people, forcibly implant a drought, as they are known, cut the cord short so they can't move without unplugging the cord, turn the dial up to max, and then plug them in. They would usually stay there, grinning, until they died, unwilling to unplug the drought, even just long enough to cross the room for food and water. This is how Louis Wu looked when the two men broke into his apartment, grinning, sitting peacefully, with a drought in his head. Louis Wu was under the wire when two men came to invade his privacy. He was in full lotus position on the lush yellow indoor grass carpet, his smile was blissful, dreamy. The apartment was small, just one big room. He could see both doors, 
but, lost in the joy that only a wirehead knows, he never saw them arrive. Suddenly, they were there, two pale youths, both over seven feet tall, studying Lewis with contemptuous smiles. One snorted and dropped something weapon-shaped in his pocket. They were stepping forward as Lewis stood up. It wasn't just the happy smile that fooled them. It was the fist-sized drowd that protruded like a black plastic canker from the crown of Louis Wu's head. They were dealing with a current addict, and they knew what to expect. For years, the man must have had no thought but for the wire trickling current into the pleasure centers of his brain. He would be near starvation from self-neglect. He was small a foot and a half shorter than either of the invaders. As they reached for him, Lewis bent far sideways for balance and kicked once, twice, thrice. One of the invaders was down, curled around himself and not breathing, before the other found the wit to back away. Lewis came after him. What held the youth half paralyzed was the abstracted bliss with which Lewis came to kill him. Too late, he reached for the stunner he'd pocketed. Lewis kicked it out of his hand. He ducked a massive fist and kicked at kneecap. Kneecap. The pale giant stopped moving. Groin. Heart. The giant bent far forward with a whistling scream. Throat. The scream stopped suddenly. The other invader was on hands and knees, breathing in sips. Lewis chopped at his neck, twice. The invaders lay still in the lush yellow grass. Lewis Wu went to lock his door. At no time had the blissful smile left his face, and it did not change when he found his door fully locked and alarmed. He checked the door to the balcony, bolted and alarmed. How in the world had they gotten in? Bemused, he settled where he was, in lotus position, and did not move again for over an hour. Presently, a timer clicked and switched off the drought. In his current adult stupor, he leaves them there for a few days, rotting until a puppeteer literally appears before his eyes. A stepping plate. Louis Wu had seen these on the puppeteer homeworlds. Nessus had even brought some along to the ring world. The puppeteer uses a neuronic whip, knocking him unconscious, and brings him to his ship, where he finds speaker to animals, also incapacitated by a whip blast. They have both been abducted by a puppeteer, and it's not Nessus. Here they find out what happened to Harlalo Prililar, the native from the ring world that had both tortured them and saved them before they brought her back to Earth. Or here they are told the official story anyway. They say that only one year and five months after Pril came to Earth with Louis Wu, she died. She was given Booster Spice, the human anti-aging drug, and it either had no effect, or it had the opposite effect. She was thousands of years old when she came to Earth, and once she was given the Booster Spice, she rapidly aged and died. So why was she given Booster Spice when she had brought back with her the perfected version from the Ring World? The government claimed it was stolen, but she was only ever in world government custody on Earth. So someone within the government stole the perfected spice? That is all the information we are given, but it leaves a massive problem. In the original Ringworld novel, it is stated that each use of the Ringworld drug stopped aging for 50 years, and taking more at once did stack the effect. So the chances she ran out of her last dose in the year she was on Earth is only about 2%, 1 in 50. Now this is possible, but highly unlikely. It seems to me that we were never told the full story. Maybe Niven just needed to get her out of the way for this novel, but the entire point of this novel was to close loopholes, so you would think Niven would not make another glaring hole like that just to have an excuse to put Lewis under the wire. A plot point that has little payoff later. So I'm going to give Niven the benefit of the doubt and say that there was some dirty things going on with Prill that we may never fully find out about unless I'm forgetting something from the later novels. This is why I reread each one before making a video on it, to see what I forgot. So Lewis, along with Speaker, now named Chmi, 
now that he's earned his name, but who I will still be referring to as speaker for obvious reasons, no way I'm saying me a hundred more times, are placed in a slaver stasis field for the trip back to the ring world against their will. It turns out that the puppeteer taking them hostage is the former hindmost, the leader of all the puppeteers, the one Nessus was married to as a reward for the first Ringworld mission. He was deposed and believes that if he can find the fabled transmutation device that was speculated to have existed in the first novel, as the only way they could think of to create enough of the scrith that made up the Ringworld Foundation, then they will again appoint him hindmost. Not so much as a reward, but because such a device would require his experimentalist political faction to deal with it, something the current conservative faction was not equipped mentally to do. The puppeteers are cowards after all. Courage, like Nessus in the former hindmost show, is considered insanity in their species. But sometimes that specific brand of insanity was needed, and they all knew it. The hindmost was now trying to create one of those times with this matter transmuter. When they questioned Prill about the device in the first novel, she said they used them on every ship to convert lead to fuel. But when they arrive in the Ringworld star system, they are shocked to discover that the Ringworld is off center from the star. One side is much closer to the star than the other, and it's getting worse. How could this have happened? Why is it happening now? Hominids have been living on the ring world for almost a million years now. The former hindmost seems completely indifferent to the fact that when the ring world collides with the star, hundreds of billions of ring world residents will die, maybe trillions. But the hindmost just wants his matter transmuter device. So they land on the rim spaceport of the ring world and begin to search a derelict ship left there for who knows how many millennia perfectly preserved in the vacuum of space. But as Speaker and Lewis searched the ship, Lewis informed Speaker that he had been doing a lot of research into Prill's claims while he was on Earth, and a lot of them didn't add up. She was obviously playing them for fools, telling them whatever they wanted to hear. First and foremost of all, her people did not make the ring world as she claimed. Her people evolved on the ring world and became its dominant race once the previous one died off, it seemed. Her people's tech would only ever work on the ring world. It could not be the tech that predated the ring world. It would have to be a different kind of tech that far surpassed what her people had, amazing as it was. Lewis knew that her ships could not be powered by lead. She had made that up, only considering what the most dense element was but lead would be a detriment in almost every way. Even steel would be a much better choice, as at least steel can strengthen the hull. Well, lead would be a stress on the hull. And yet her people's ships were made of steel and not scrith. Lewis did not say this where the hindmost could hear, however, as he feared that if the insane puppeteer found out that he and Speaker were useless in this failed mission, he would abandon them there. Why risk bringing dangerous aliens back to their homeworld when they were kidnapped and upset with him for it? If he left them there, the Ringworld would impact the sun in about a year. There was no chance of them getting off the Ringworld in that short amount of time to seek vengeance. Lewis noticed something odd about the ship they were searching. It was mostly steel, which raises the question of where they got the steel on the Ringworld a land with no metal deposits and no earth to mine in. Upon failing to find the device, they decide that they will search on the inside of the rim wall. Speaker takes them up to the top of the thousand mile tall wall in a small excursion vehicle. Here they survey the land below them. Other than the typical ring world geography, they see what appears to be an entire floating city. Thinking that if any high tech still exists on the ring world, it would likely be there, so they set off in that direction on a hundred thousand mile trip. Speaker boosts their vehicle up to ten thousand miles per hour, but even at this ridiculous speed, it will take ten hours to get there. They fly at an altitude only about one or two hundred miles high, where they are not in the ring world's atmosphere but they are still well below the thousand mile tall rim walls, keeping them safe from the automated meteor defense systems that took out their ship on the first mission. 
They stop at a tribal area a few hundred miles from the city to ask the locals about it. The people they meet are short and thin with red skin and sharp teeth, but despite their appearance, they are friendly and invite Speaker and Lewis into their huts. They seem unfazed by their looks or claims to be from beyond the arch in the sky, the visible part of the ring world. Here they first learn of Rishathra, the practice of interspecies mating. As they learned on their first trip to the ring world, it was entirely populated with hominids, taking up every ecological niche. So every species they met was a variation on humanity. Because of this, most, but not all, could have sexual relations with each other. This would almost never produce offspring, but everyone all had the same parts for the actual action, so why not? It helped them stem overpopulation and worked as a diplomatic tool in some cases. Just ask the bonobos here on Earth. Unfortunately, this tribe lived too far away from the floating city to know anything about it. And also, they didn't practice Rishathra, for all you demonophiles out there. <laughs> but Speaker had been forcibly given booster spice for Kazin by the hindmost, so he was experiencing his youth over again. And on these wild plains, his instincts forced him to hunt. So he bounded off into the tall grass. Lewis, on the other hand, was experiencing current withdrawals since the hindmost had taken his drought away and was using it as leverage against him. Which of course for Lewis Wu just made him stop using it. No one would have such easy control over him. Despite being well over 200 years old, he still had his pride. In his depressed state, he couldn't help but think of the selfish acts and blunders he had taken during his first stay on the ring world. This time, he was determined to make what little amends he could. So he had the ship synthesize a few hundred pounds of meat to give to their hosts as a first step. All the while, thinking about the city he had destroyed just to get off the ring world the first time. All the lives he must have ended. On their previous visit, their ship had crashed into the ring world, taking out one of the filaments that held the shadow squares together. This had resulted in several thousand miles of this very thin, very strong string landing on and covering a city like mist. An inhabited city. Granted, the people that lived there cut off one of Nessus's heads after that using the wire, but they were right to be upset. Their city was now a dangerous disaster, and it must have been the fault of the devils. The one with two heads, the giant one in red fur, and the most normal looking one that used sorcery to speak, Lewis Wu's translator. They needed to be stopped. So what did Lewis do in response? He used the string to pull their ship over the edge of the fist of God, which undoubtedly cut the entire city to gravel as it pulled taut, slicing everything in its way, be it stone or human flesh. It was possible that Lewis wiped out an entire culture with that one act. He never went back to check. All just in a desperate, blind dash to get off the ring world as soon as possible. That night after the feast, the village had intruders. Giant, maned men in armor. Without warning, they began to kill the animals their host tribe herded. Lewis and Speaker fired their stun cannon at the group, putting them all to sleep. When he awakens, they question their leader why they attacked. It turns out that they eat grass, but the animals being herded ate all their local grass, so Lewis decides to keep up his generous streak and helps the giants. Their grazing land has been severely reduced by a spreading field of slaver sunflowers. The genetically engineered ancient plants created over a billion years ago by the Tenuctapan as another devious trap for their slaver masters. The slavers used them as boundary defenses for their massive estates. But when the day of the rebellion came, and the Tenuctapun flipped their switch, they all turned on their masters, and instead of using their mirror heads to reflect light at enemies, cooking them to death, they began attacking their slaver masters. These were the same flowers that had almost burnt Speaker to death on their first visit to the Ring World. Now, they were expanding across the Ring World and destroying everything in their path. The grazers could go to the flowers and eat them at night, but they must be far away by first light, or they would be cooked to death. 
So Lewis came up with a plan. The hindmost had brought copious amounts of a superconductor in case they needed to repair any Ringworld equipment. After all, the problem, according to Prill, was that a bacteria had been introduced to the Ringworld, which had eaten all its superconductor. According to the hindmost, this version he had brought was immune to the virus, making Lewis question how he would know that. So Lewis took the superconductor and wrapped it around a repulsor plate, a magnetic plate that would repel itself off the magnetic ringworld floor. Lewis flew as close to the sunflowers as he could without being charred to a crisp. He hovered over a small sea that the sunflowers were beginning to encompass. He dropped an end of the superconductor into the sea and set the repulsor plate to about a dozen miles high and then released it. The sunflowers, not having any depth perception, saw a dot in the sky and thought it was a bird. Every local sunflower on the shoreline targeted it with the reflections of the sun's light, heating it up rapidly, but only to water's boiling point. You see, these superconductors don't just perfectly equalize all electricity, they also perfectly equalize temperature. So as the sunflowers heated the superconducting line trailing into the water, this heated up the entire length equally and began boiling the water. And as anyone who knows anything about the physics of boiling water knows, boiling water releases its energy by changing states to steam and escaping instead of increasing the temperature further. This meant that unless the sea completely dried up, the superconductor would keep creating steam and staying at 100 degrees Celsius or 200 degrees Fahrenheit. This meant that there was a massive amount of steam escaping from the water where the superconducting line fell into it. The sunflowers were putting out an amazing amount of energy and reflecting it all at the repulsor plate. A huge cloud of steam began to drift over the sunflower fields, cutting off their light. As this happened, they closed up, as they do at night, and waited. If they didn't die from lack of light, they would at least be harmless to the grazers. This hopefully would reopen up some of their grazing land for them. After dropping the Grazer King off, they continued on the way to the floating city. But Speaker and Lewis had a talk. The giant grazer's armor. The spacesuits and the derelict ship on the rim. They both looked like a pack protector. The ancient race that had tried and failed to colonize Earth over two million years ago. The ancestors of all humanity. If you want to learn any more about them, you can watch my video on the book Protector, where humanity meets their first adult stage pack in over two million years. The pack had tried to colonize Earth, and it had resulted in the human race. The pack had also clearly built the ring world, which is why it was so full of hominids that seemed to be all kinds and variations of humanity. But the pack would wipe out any mutations, so just like on Earth, Something must have happened to the pack. They must have left the ring world untended for long enough for their breeders to mutate into every ecological niche possible, even the carrion eaters and bloodsuckers. Lewis and Speaker continued on to the floating city. They began to see rudimentary cars, boxes on wheels with large engines, slowly trundling along. As they approached the city, they decided to land by a solo car and try to introduce themselves to the natives. But as they landed, they noticed that the people were retreating to a building with a different species of hominid chasing them. Speaker and Lewis decided to pull the same favor they did before and neutralize the attackers. But as they floated on their repulsor belts through the buildings in pursuit, suddenly, Lewis lost his mind. He started to recklessly careen through the building in hot pursuit of the white-skinned attackers, and when he found them, he ripped off all his impact armor and clothes and began to furiously copulate with one. When he awoke the next morning, he tried to remember what had happened the night before. She was about Lewis's height, and on the stocky side of pretty. Not flat-chested, but not busty either. Her black hair was bound in a long braid, and there was a disconcerting fringe of beard along her jaw. She slept the sleep of exhaustion. She'd earned it. They both had. Now he was beginning to remember, but his memories didn't make much sense. He'd been making love. No, 
He'd been head over heels in love with the pale, slender woman with the red lips. Seeing his blood on her mouth, feeling the sting in his neck, had left him only with a terrible sense of loss. He'd howled when Chimi twisted her head around until her neck snapped. He'd fought when the Kazin plucked him off the dead woman. The Kazin had tucked him under one arm. He was still raging, still fighting, while Chimi fished the medkit out of Lewis's vest and slapped a patch on his neck and tucked the medkit away again. Then Chimi had killed them, all the pretty silver-haired men and women, spearing them accurately through their heads with the brilliant ruby needle of his flashlight laser. Lewis remembered trying to stop him and being thrown rolling across the broken pavement. He'd staggered to his feet and seen someone else moving and moved towards her. Her, the dark-haired woman, the only defender left alive. They'd moved into each other's arms. Why had they done that? And Chimi had tried to get his attention, hadn't he? Lewis remembered a shrieking as of tigers at war. Pheromones he said, and they looked so harmless. He stood up and looked about him in sheer horror. The dead were all around him. The dark ones with wounded necks, the pale ones with blood on their mouths and black char marks in their silver hair. The guns hadn't been enough. What the vampires had was worse than a tasp. They'd put out a super stimulus cloud of pheromones human scent signals of sexual readiness. One of the vampires, or a pair, must have reached the tower, and the defenders had come out running, shedding guns and clothing, in a haste that sent one over the banister to his death. But why, with the vampires dead, had he and the dark-haired woman... The wind tossed at Lewis's hair. Yeah, the vampires were dead, but he and the dark-haired woman were still in a cloud of pheromones. They'd made it in a frenzy. If the wind hadn't come up, we'd still be doing it. Yeah, now, where the tangent to leave everything. He found the impact armor in the flying belt. The undersuit was torn to shreds. What about the vest? He saw that the woman's eyes were open. She sat up suddenly, with a horror in her eyes that Lewis could well understand. He said to her, I've got to have the vest because the translator's in it. I hope Chimi doesn't frighten you off before I can... Chimi? How would this look to him? Chimi's great hand engulfed Lewis's skull and twisted it backwards. Lewis clung to the woman with his body and his mind and thrust, thrust. But his eyes were filled with that orange beast face and his ears with screaming insults. It was distracting. Chimi wasn't in sight. Lewis found the vest a good distance away, gripped in a vampire's dead hand. He couldn't find the stunner. By now he was really worried. Something ugly was thrusting out of his memory. He was running when he reached the place where they'd grounded the lander. A chunk of rock too big for three men to lift was holding down a generous pile of black superconducting cloth. Chmi's parting gift. The lander was gone. Lewis found himself stranded by speaker and taken hostage by the woman. She belonged to the machine people, as they were called. The people that were in the process of taking over the society that the dying remnants of Prill's people were leaving behind. After trying to shoot Lewis and his impact armor protecting him, the odd woman stopped treating him like a slave, and he explained where he was from, and promised her he would try to save the ring world. The machine people had many subject races, and considered themselves equals with the last of Prill's race, the people that occupied the floating city. It was a conglomeration of all the floating buildings that happened to have their own power sources when the rest fell. They had moved them all to huddle together and pretend that their civilization had not collapsed. Lewis waited until night and then floated up to the city on his repulsor belt. Here, for the second time, he was caught with the hood of his impact armor down and was struck in the head. He recovered from this before hitting the ground, but came back up and was almost immediately shot in the repulsor belt, destroying it. Now, 
Somewhat a captive of the people who had attacked him, he assessed his situation. He used his superior knowledge to bargain his way into seeing their library. Here, he discovers his hunch was right. There was a team remounting what few ramjets remained. It seems Prill's people had evolved on the ring world. Here, they developed their tech to the point where they could not build new bus or ramjets, but they could steal the ones acting as attitude jets off the ring world. The ones that were meant to stabilize it from the effects of solar flares and such. They did not have the materials on the ring world to make more. The only materials they could find were already parts of the ring world, so that is what they used. And when nothing bad seemed to happen, they took more and more until they had stolen every last one. As a quick aside, apparently there actually were a few mines on the ring world that's mentioned at one point. I don't know if this was a mistake or if it was somehow designed into the ring world itself. I don't know why the pack would do this, however, seeing as their breeders were basically non-sentient and they would kill any mutations, so why build mines? But they actually did mention mines at one point, so I'm very confused about that. Anyway, when the cities fell, most of the spaceships, each with a stolen ramjet in them, departed to their colonized worlds, where the societies would not have relied as heavily on superconductor yet and would therefore have been far less impacted. This meant that there were not nearly enough ramjets left to stabilize the ring world, even once the last few that remained were reinstalled. The group doing the installations was a mystery. It was not the people of the floating city, and they did not know who it was, but they were working very fast and efficiently, almost like a pack. But if the pack were not gone from the ring world, then the hominids would never have been allowed to mutate into all these different races in the first place. So it couldn't be a pack leading the workers. Whoever it was, they must be as, or more, advanced than the city builders of the floating city. Just to get into the library, Lewis's captor had to do some bartering. It seemed that all the separate floating buildings were remaining independent. They were not a city, more like a group of castles, like the one Lewis stayed at in the first novel, all flown right up next to one another and attached with makeshift walkways. And always on the brink of conflict. Each clan used a building to live in and they rarely left it. Some buildings were more sparse than others. Some were not even designed for people to live in. One looked to have originally been a spa. The only thing they all had in common was that these were the buildings that remained in the sky, self-powered, when the rest of their civilization, that were attached to the ring world's energy grid, fell. Lewis began to realize this was not a new seed of civilization. This was a group of people in denial, living in the past as their buildings crumbled around them. Lewis would find no help here, but he was able to repair a few of the ancient machines with the superconductor cloth which gained him enough favor to be allowed into the library. Here, he returned the city's lack of kindness to him, and as a favor for being made into a slave, he stole the information he needed, along with an ancient machine to read the information, and colluded with the hindmost to teleport away on a stepping disk attached to one of the ship's probes. Now reunited with the hindmost, they traveled to pick up Speaker, who went to the map of Kazin. The booster spice that the hindmost had forcibly given him had healed his scars from his first trip and had returned him to his youthful vigor. On their first trip to the ring world, they had discovered that there were several maps of planets in the two large oceans. In one ocean, the maps were unknown, most likely planets on the far side of the ring world from known space because the planets in the other ocean were all the inhabited planets in known space. Earth was one of them, all the continents laid out flat. Mars was also there due to the Martians that lived in the sands, and Jinx because of the Bandersnatchy that lived there. Kazin, Speaker's homeworld, was also there, as well as several others that were the homeworlds of other species that lived in known space, like the Trinoch and Pyrrhon. And each of these maps were stocked with the native life. 
There were Martians on the Martian map, Bandersnatchy on the Jinx map, and Kazinti on the map of Kazin. But no humans on the map of Earth, because humans were mutated pack breeders, and since the entire ring world was made for breeders, that would have been redundant. Apparently, all these worlds were stocked nearly a million years ago, when the ring world was new. Which means that the pack that built the ring world visited Earth while there were mutating breeders on it and did nothing about it for some reason. Because the pack that brought humans to Earth did it around 2.5 million years ago. The pack that built the ring world were strange pack that didn't seem to think like the rest. Even the human Brennan, when he became a protector, wiped out the Martians as a possible threat, even though they didn't have space travel or really any technology. Yet these ones brought not just Martians, but many other species to their world. So when Lewis ran off from Speaker and started to wildly have sex with a vampire that was trying to kill him, Speaker didn't just abandon Lewis for no reason. The Kazinti booster spice was regressing him back to his adolescence and he had decided that if Lewis could abandon the mission for relations, then so could he, and he had taken off to the map of Kazin to find some mates. This didn't go well. The Kazinti on the real planet Kazin had lost several wars against mankind. Each time they did, the most aggressive of them were called from the population in the battles. During the first mission of the Ringworld, Nessus had let it slip that the puppeteers were actually helping mankind and instigating the Kazinti so that this exact thing would happen. They were trying to breed the Kazinti into less dangerous, more rational beings so that they were less of a threat, and the puppeteers were using mankind to do their dirty work without either race knowing about it. But regardless of the questionable morality of this decision, it seems it was a good one for all involved, as Speaker found out firsthand upon reaching the map of Kazin. They were insane. Despite Speaker having a massive superiority on the battlefield with his advanced spacecraft, they all decided that there were only two options, death or victory. And for hours they charged to their doom while not even scratching the lander. Finally, it was Speaker who gave up out of frustration. Instead, he found a smaller outpost and used his neuronic whip on them all. He drug the males outside, locked the gates, and for nine straight hours had his way with their women until the men outside woke up and broke back in, at which point Speaker was lucky to make it back to the lander with his life. But he was badly wounded, so he went into the auto dock and was sedated, while the Kazin outside ceaselessly attacked the lander with whatever they could. The recently reunited Lewis and Hindmost decided to go retrieve Speaker. They left the spaceport ledge and went beneath the floor of the Ringworld. The plan was to use the Fist of God Mountain to enter the Ringworld, which was actually a puncture through the floor of the Ringworld by a massive comet, the same hole they had left through at the end of their first trip. Well under there, they decided to inspect the bottom side of the maps since they were basically on the way to the Fist of God. And lucky they did, because when they got to the bottom side of Mars, there was nothing there. On the bottom side of Earth in Kazin, you could see the land in negative, like looking at the bottom of one of those plastic boss relief maps. But for Mars, nothing was there. It just looked like a sea bottom. Because the map was the land of the planet laid flat, that meant that under the map of Mars, there was a disk of storage area bigger around than the entire planet. This is what Lewis had been hoping for. The control center for the ring world must be hidden under there. They travel through the fist of God and head for the map of Mars, but they are shot down by the automated meteor defense shield for going too fast. Or so they at first thought. Their slaver stasis field had activated, saving them and the ship, so they continued on. This time, more warily. They kept a watch on the Ringworld sun and the shadow squares to see what was firing at them. They retrieved Speaker from the horde of native Kazin attacking his ship as he slept peacefully in the auto dock. He emerges from the auto dock and takes over control of the lander once again. Lewis returns to the ship when they notice the sun is having another solar flare. They are being fired at again. So Speaker flicks into existence from the lander, fearing he is what is being fired at. 
but instead the plasma is lased into the map of Earth and again into the map of Kazin. This was not automated. Something on those maps was being fired upon by a living creature. Nothing was flying anywhere near those maps. After traveling through the Fist of God, they reach the map of Mars and begin to inspect the map for a way into the underside. Here they find three things. Massive doors around the edge of the map. A hole in the top of Olympus Mons. And a flying building above the hole. The building looks remarkably like the one that Speaker, Lewis, Tila, and Prill flew along in during the first mission to the Ring World. They can't figure out how to open the massive doors, so they enter through the top of Olympus Mons. And immediately, their slaver stasis field is activated. They were attacked. When it finally turns off, they find their ship has been covered in lava, so it cannot escape, and hacked into their video feeds was the face of a protector. It was Tila Brown. She had found the map of Mars and had eaten the tree of life root underneath it, transforming her into a protector. But why was she attacking Lewis and his crew? As a quick aside, when Lewis escaped the library, two of the city builders followed him through the stepping plates. I haven't mentioned them until now because they do not play a very large role. One is Harkoby Parolin, an adult female. The other is an adolescent boy, Kawaris Xenjajak. What do you want from us? That was Kawara Senjajok, speaking diffidently in the city builder tongue, echoed in Interworld by the translator. Nothing, Tila and city builder. Then what are we doing here? Nothing. I've seen to it that you can do nothing. I don't understand. The boy was near tears. Why do you want to bury us underground? Child, I do what I must. I must prevent 1.5 times 10 to the 12th murders. Lewis opened his eyes. Harkaby Parolin objected heatedly. But we're here to prevent deaths. Don't you know that this world is off-center, sliding into the sun? I know of that. I formed the team that has been remounting the ring world's attitude jets, reversing the damage done by your species. Louis Wu says that isn't enough. It isn't. They had Louis Wu's complete attention now. The librarian shook her head. I don't understand. With the attitude jets in action, we extend the lifespan of the ring world by as much as a year. An extra year for three times ten to the thirteenth intelligent beings is equivalent to giving everyone on Earth an extra thousand years of lifespan. A worthy accomplishment. My collaborators agreed, even those who are not protectors. Lewis could trace the lines of Tila Brown's face in the protector's leather mask. Bulges at the hinges of the jaw, a skull swollen to accommodate more brain tissue. But it was Tila, and it hurt terribly. Why doesn't she go away? Habits die hard, and Lewis had an analytic mind. He thought, why doesn't she go away? A dying protector in a doomed artificial world. She doesn't have a minute to spare, talking to a collection of trapped breeders. What does she think she's doing? He turned to her face. You formed the repair crew, did you? Who are they? My parents helped. Most hominids will at least listen to me. I gathered a team of several hundred thousand from various species. I brought three here to become protectors, from the Spill Mountain people and the Night people and the vampires. I hoped that they would see a solution hidden to me. Their viewpoints would differ. The vampire, for instance, was non-sentient before the change. They failed me, said Tila. She certainly behaved as if she had time. Time to entertain trapped aliens and breeders until the ring world brushed the shadow squares. They saw no better solution, and so we mounted the remaining bussard ramjets on the rim wall. We have now mounted all but the last. Under the directions of the remaining protector, my team will gear the remaining Ringworld spacecraft to carry them to safety around some nearby star. Some Ringworlders will survive. We're back to the original question, Lewis said. Your crew is hard at work. What are you doing here? I'm right. She's trying to tell us something. I came to prevent the murder of 1,500,000 million intelligent hominids. 
I recognized the neutrino exhausts from thrusters built in human space, and I came to the only feasible scene of the crime. I waited. Here you are. Here we are, Lewis agreed. But you know Tangwell we didn't come to commit any murders whatever. You would have. Why? I can't tell you that. Yet she showed no inclination to end the conversation. It was a strange game Tila was playing. They would have to guess at the rules. Lewis asked, Suppose you could save the ring world by killing one and a half trillion inhabitants out of thirty trillion. A protector would do that, wouldn't she? Five percent to save ninety-five percent? It seems so... efficient. Can you empathize with that many thinking beings, Lewis? Or can you only imagine one death at a time, with yourself in the starring role? He didn't answer. Thirty billion people inhabit human space. Picture all of them dead. Picture fifty times that population dying of, let's say, radiation poisoning. Do you sense their pain, their regrets, their thoughts for each other? From that many? The numbers are too large. Your brain won't handle it. But mine will. Oh. I can't make it happen. I can't let it happen. I know I must stop you. Tila, picture a shadow square sweeping down the width of the ring world at around 700 miles per second. Picture a thousand times the population of human space dying as the ring world disintegrates. I do. Lewis nodded. Pieces of a puzzle. Tila would give them as many pieces as she could. She couldn't make herself hand them a finished picture, so keep fishing for pieces. Did you say the remaining protector? There were four, and now there's one plus you? What happened to the others? Two protectors left the repair crew at the same time I did. They must have left separately. Perhaps they found the clues that announced your arrival. I felt it necessary to track them down and stop them. Really? If they were protectors, they could no more kill a trillion and a half thinking hominids than you could. They might arrange for it to happen, somehow. Somehow. Careful with the wording now. He was glad that nobody was trying to interrupt. Not even Shmi, the soft-spoken diplomat. Somehow, let breeders reach the only place on the ring world where the crime can be committed. Would that have been their strategy if you hadn't stopped them? Perhaps. Let these carefully chosen breeders be protected from smelling tree of life somehow. Pressure suits. That was why Teal had been looking for an interstellar spacecraft. Let them become aware of the situation somehow. Somehow, a protector has to double-think his way out of killing them before they can see the solution and use it. Killing astronomical numbers of breeders to save even more, is that what you think you prevented? Yes. And this is the right place? Why else would I be waiting here? There's one protector left. Will he come after you? No. The night people protector knows that she alone is left to supervise the evacuation. If she tries to kill me, and I kill her, breeders alone might die en route. You do seem to kill very easily, Lewis said bitterly. No, I can't kill 5% of the ring world populace, and I don't know that I can kill you, Lewis. You are a breeder of my species. On the ring world, you are alone in that regard. I thought of ways to save the ring world, said Lewis Wu. If you know of a large-scale transmutation device, we know how to use it. Certainly the pack had none. That was not your cleverest deduction, Lewis. If we could punch a hole under one of the great oceans, then control the outflow, we could use the reaction to put the ring world back in place. Clever. But you can't make a hole, and you can't plug it. Furthermore, there is a solution that does less damage, yet it is too much damage, and I cannot permit it. How would you save the ring world? The protector said, I can't. Where are we? What went on in this part of the repair center? A long moment passed. The protector said, I may not tell you more than you know. I don't see how you can escape, but I must consider the possibility. So Tila knew that killing 5% of the population of the ring world could save the rest. 
but her instincts would only let her protect breeders, not kill them. At least not 1.5 trillion of them. That was an atrocity beyond her ability, regardless of the positive consequences for the other 30 trillion. Lewis would have to do it. That is what she was trying to tell him. Lewis would have to kill her and save the ring world by killing 1.5 trillion. And she, a protector, would be trying to stop him the entire time. Puppeteers were incredibly smart, but protectors made them look like children mentally. And while a Kazin had an incredible aptitude for battle from birth, a protector could manhandle one without too much issue in a one-on-one -on -one fight. And that's with or without weapons. There was only two things they had on their side. Numbers and the fact that Tila didn't want to win. She was tricking even herself into believing she did, so that her instincts would be satisfied. But instincts and massive intellect regularly run contrary to each other. So while her emotions and instincts made her protect those 1.5 trillion by trying to kill Lewis and crew, her analytical mind desperately wanted him to kill her and save the ring world, regardless of the cost. Tila first tried to destroy the lander with Speaker in it, forcing him to escape through the stepping disks to the ship once again. Next, she hacked into the hindmost's stepping plates and teleported into Lewis and Speaker's living space, with the hindmost safely on the other side of the wall of a general products hall, one of, if not the, most durable substance in the entire known space universe. Its only competition being Scrith, which isn't as strong, and a slaver stasis field, which technically isn't a substance. The hindmost tried to turn off the stepping disc, but he was a moment too late, and she escaped before he could trap her. But this let her see that Speaker and Lewis were no longer in the ship. They had teleported to the stepping disc attached to a probe that was at the top of Olympus Mons. In spacesuits, they descended once again into the hole leading down into the command center, or repair center as Lewis called it, of the ring world. They followed the path the ship had taken before, but when they got to the point where Tila had been beaming heat at the ship to keep its slaver stasis fields on, they could not follow due to the residual heat. It was still too hot. So trying to maintain radio silence, Speaker led them down another path, to a strange sphere they had seen on the deep radar. The sphere was large, but otherwise not noteworthy. But what made it strange is as they watched, a source of neutrinos was slowly circling the outside edge of the sphere. They knew what it must be at once, and now Speaker was leading them there. It wasn't a bad plan. Everyone who had studied the pack knew that they only had one food, Tree of Life. Sooner or later, Tila would be forced to enter this room and harvest more Tree of Life. The slowly moving neutrino source was an artificial sun, and the giant sphere was an underground hydroponics garden, specifically for the Tree of Life route. This is the room that Tila and Seeker had accidentally come across, and when they smelled the Tree of Life route, they had gone literally insane taken over by an ancient instinct too strong to deny. They both gorged themselves on the Tree of Life route, but Seeker, being too old, died. Tila, however, was of the proper age, and she transformed into a protector. The same thing would happen to Lewis as happened to Seeker if he smelled the route. So he stayed in his spacesuit, and they set up an ambush in the garden. They didn't have to wait long. Now, Tila came like a guided missile, just under the corridor's roof. Lewis glimpsed her as he rolled to fire. She was standing upright on a disc six feet across, hanging on to an upright post with handles and controls on it. Lewis fired. Shmi fired from wherever he hid. Two threads of ruby light touched the same target. Tila was squatting by then, hidden by the disc. 
She'd seen all she wanted, placed their position to the inch. But the flying disc flared ruby flame, and it was falling. Lewis had a last glimpse of Tila before she dropped behind the strange lacy trees. She had spread a tiny paraglider, so assume she's alive and unhurt, and move away fast. Economically, Lewis went over the crest of the hill and watched from the other side. It could work, and his tail of superconductor thread was still in the pond. Where was she? Something leaped from the crest of the next hill over. Green light speared it in midair and held while the thing flamed and died. So much for Shmi's spacesuit, but a flight of hand-sized missiles flew towards the base of the green laser beam. Half a dozen white flashes from behind the rise, and the snap of lightning striking close showed that Shmi had succeeded in turning puppeteer-made batteries into bombs. Tila was close, and she was using a laser. And if she was circling the pond, just beyond the crest, Lewis adjusted his position. Shmi's burnt suit had fallen too slowly. A protector would know it was empty. Cthulhu and Allah. How could anyone fight a lucky protector? Tila popped up, lower down the hillside than Lewis had expected, speared Lewis on a lance of green light, and was gone before Lewis's thumb could move. Lewis blinked. The flare shielding in his helmet had saved his eyes, but, instincts or no, Tila was trying to kill Lewis Wu. She popped up again elsewhere. Green light died on black cloth. This time, Lewis fired back. She was gone. He didn't know whether he'd hit her. He'd glimpsed pliant leather armor a little loose on her, and joints swollen hugely, knuckles and finger joints like walnuts, knees and elbows like cantaloupes. She wore no armor except her own skin. Lewis rolled sideways and down the hill. He started crawling, fast. Crawling was hard work. Where would she be next? He'd never played this game. In 200 years of life, he'd never been a soldier. Two puffs of steam drifted above the pond. To his left, Harkaby Parolin suddenly stood and fired. Where was Tila? Her laser didn't answer. Harkaby Parolin stood like a black-robed target, and she ducked and ran down the hill, flattened out and started to crawl left and upwards. The rock came from her left, and how could Tila have been there that fast? It smacked Harkaby Parolin's arm, hard enough to smash bone and to rip the sleeve open. The city builder woman stood howling, and Lewis waited to see her cut down. Futz, 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 but track the beam. No beam came, and he shouldn't be watching, he should be acting. He had seen where the rock came from, there was a cleft between two hills, and he crawled as fast as he dared to put hillside between him and Tila. Then around, Tange, where was Shmi now? Lewis risked a glance over the crest. Harkaby Parolin had stopped screaming. She sniffed. She dropped her flying belt and tore the black cloth away, one-handed. Her other arm flapped loose, broken. She began trying to take off her suit. Tila had been there. Where would she move? She was ignoring Harkaby Parolin. Harkaby Parolin's helmet couldn't come loose. She reeled down the hill, straining to rip the fabric one-handed, then smashing at the faceplate with a rock. Too much time was passing. Tila could be anywhere by now. Lewis moved again, to a notch carved by a brook now dry. If he tried a hilltop, she'd be watching it. Could she actually guess his every move? Protect her. Where was she now? Behind me? Lewis felt spiders on the back of his neck. He spun around, for no good reason, and fired at Tila as a small metal tool slashed along his ribs. The missile ripped his suit and flesh and jarred his aim. He clasped his left arm across the torn fabric while playing the ruby beam where Tila had last been. Then she popped up and was gone before the beam could reach her, and a dense metal ball sprayed chips from his helmet. He rolled downhill holding his suit shut with his left arm. Through the starred helmet, he saw Tila coming at him like a great black bat, and he held the ruby beam on her faster than she could dodge. Tange damn it, she wasn't dodging, and why should she? Harkaby Parolin's suit of black superconducting cloth was now worn by Tila Brown. He held the beam on her with both hands. She'd get warmer than she liked before she killed him. 
The armored demon bounded towards him with black cloth shredding around her like wet tissue. Shredding? Why? And what was that smell? She veered and threw the laser like a missile sideways at Shmi. Disintegrator and flashlight laser spun away from Shmi's hand. They crashed together. The smell of Tree of Life was in Lewis's nose and in his brain. It was not like the wire. Current was sufficient unto itself, an expression that demanded nothing further to make it perfect. The smell of Tree of Life was ecstasy, but it sparked a raging hunger. Lewis knew what Tree of Life was now. It had glossy dark green leaves and roots like a sweet potato. And it was all around him. And the taste. Something in his brain remembered the taste of paradise. It was all around him. And he couldn't eat. He couldn't eat. He couldn't eat because of his helmet. And he tore his hands away from the clamps that would release his helmet. Because he couldn't eat while the human variant of a pack protector was killing Shmi. He steadied the laser with both hands, as if it might recoil. The Kazin and the Protector were inextricably tangled and rolling downhill, leaving shreds of black cloth. He followed them down with a thread of ruby light. First fire, then aim. You're not really hungry. It will kill you. You're too old to make the change to Protector. It would kill you. Tange, the smell. His brain reeled with it. The strain of resisting it was horrible. It was every bit as bad as not resetting his drought every evening of his life for these past 18 years. Intolerable. Lewis held the beam steady and waited. Tila missed a disemboweling kick. For an instant, her leg stuck straight out. The red thread touched it, and Tila's shin flashed eye-searing red. He saw another clear shot that disappeared as he fired. Part of Shmi's nude pink tail flared and fell away, wreathing like an injured worm. Shmi didn't seem to notice, but Tila knew where the beam was. She tried to throw Shmi into it. Lewis moved the wand of red light clear and waited. Shmi had been slashed. He was bleeding in several places, but he was on top of the protector, using his mass. Lewis noticed a sharp-edged rock nearby, like a carefully flaked fist axe. That would crush Shmi's skull. He released the trigger and aimed at the rock. Tila's hand flashed out for it and burst into flame. Surprise, Tila. Tange, the smell. I'll kill you for the smell of Tree of Life. A hand gone and a lower leg. Tila should be handicapped by that. But how badly had she damaged Shmi? They must have been tiring, because Lewis caught a clear glimpse of Tila's hard beak and Shmi's thick neck. Shmi twisted, and for an instant, there was nothing behind Tila's misshapen skull but blue sky. Lewis waved the light into her brain. So Protector Tila was defeated, and Speaker and the Hindmost did what needed to be done. Well, Lewis thought of the lives lost. He had wanted to do some good on this trip, unlike his last. In his last trip, he had turned a city of innocence to rubble and gore. He had sliced scared natives to pieces with his laser. He had dropped parts of buildings on worshipping crowds below. He had told Prill that he would take her back to civilization and protect her. And instead, he had gotten her killed. This time, he had wanted to make amends. He kicked his current addiction. He saved the herders from attack. He had given the grazers new safe land to graze. He had given superconducting cloth to Vala, the machine person who had taken him captive, and then they had become friends. He gave more of it to the people on the floating city and showed them how to repair ancient equipment with it. He had tried to do some good on the Ringworld this time. Meanwhile, the hindmost used the superconducting grid in the Ringworld floor to cause a solar flare. But instead of lazing it at the Ringworld floor as Tila had done to them, they left it unattenuated so that the plasma drifted across the 5% of Ringworld ramjets that Tila had reinstalled, increasing their output exponentially. You see, the bussard ramjets that acted as attitude stabilizers for the Ringworld 
were powered by interstellar hydrogen they collected with a massive magnetic field that acted as a scoop as they spun through space at 770 miles a second. So when the sun had a massive solar flare aimed right at them, they collected exponentially more fuel than they normally would, and therefore had an exponentially greater output than they normally would, giving those 5% of remaining engines output equal to 100% of normal thrust when all motors were still attached. AKA, they put out 20 times their normal output. But, this also massively irradiated the land around those thrusters. And where had those thrusters been placed? The entire trip Lewis had taken was inside that 5% of the ring world. The ring world was saved. They saved the lives of over 30 trillion ring world residents at the cost of 1.5 trillion. And 100% of the people Lewis had met on the ring world were included in that 5%. Every single person he had met and helped were irradiated by the solar flare and most likely suffered quite a bit before dying a horrific death to radiation poisoning. Lewis had wanted to make amends for his first trip. He had wanted to make a difference on the ring world. And he had. He saved it. By killing everyone he met. Tila was right. His human mind could not grasp the abstract thought of saving 30 trillion. But he could vividly imagine the deaths of everyone he had tried to help in person. Would Vala, the machine woman, blame him? for her and her people's deaths as she and everyone she knew began to suffer the effects of radiation poisoning? Would the herders and grazers pray to the god Lewis to help them as their skin sloughed off their bodies and their families died around them? These are the kinds of thoughts one never forgets. Okay, that's it for the story, but I still have a few things to talk about. First, I want to bring this up because not only did it bother me when I first read the original Ringworld, I can see from the comments that it's a common complaint. Teal is luck. In the first novel, it seems to be a big point in the novel, as well as a big point of contention with the readers. But in this sequel, Niven seems to walk this back. Tila says that she never believed in her supposed luck in the first place, and now, as a super genius protector, she thinks that luck doesn't exist. It's just probability. And to think that one person could be bred to be lucky is nonsense. If luck were genetic, then there would be more than one lucky person. Lucky people would have lucky babies. And then, who would the luck go to? Luck is a zero-sum game when you look at statistics. For every lucky action, there is an unlucky one to even it out. Otherwise, it wouldn't be lucky. It would just be normal or average. So why would Tila be the lucky one? Wouldn't there be billions of lucky ones in the future? And wouldn't their luck drive the lives of others? A lucky person would not have traveled across space to a dangerous location where she would learn pain for the first time, then find the mate of her dreams, only to tragically lose him. And at the same time, become a monster. All just to save a world she would never even have known about otherwise. The lucky ones were the citizens of the ring world in that case, not Tila. If luck was real, then it drove her actions for them. To save them, because they were the lucky ones, all 30 plus trillion of them, more than lived in the entirety of known space many times over. So to say that she was driving the actions of the first trip just doesn't make any sense. If she were truly lucky, she would have stayed at home making more lucky babies, because if she had a near infinite number of lucky descendants, their luck would have outweighed hers. Their luck to exist would have outweighed her luck to have fun. And finally, I have a conundrum for you. Niven said he never planned on writing a sequel to Ringworld, and on the face of it, it would seem like he tied the Ringworld into his known space universe in the sequel, Ringworld Engineers, where you would think he made retcons to place the Ringworld into his universe. But there's one problem with that theory. The floating castle. 
When Lewis first saw it, he thought about the silliness of making such a gaudy castle on the ring world, when all you had to do was look up to see the might of its creators. A comparatively small and much less spectacular castle was less than redundant. It was pointless. Now you might say, oh, but that individual wanted to show off. But how would a floating castle impress the people that made the ring world? It seems to me that Niven intended on the ring world being built by another race from the beginning. The only question is, was it always the pack? If you think you know the answer, go ahead and leave it in the comments. Hey, thanks for watching. I really appreciate you staying this long, and since you did, hopefully that means you like my channel. So I'd really appreciate it if you would like, comment, and most importantly, subscribe, so I can see you back here for the next one. Take care.